So let me, uh, let me introduce you to our, our panelists today. We've got first Jerry Fankhauser with uh, UF IFAS. He is the assistant director of the Florida Agriculture Experiment Station. Uh, he reports to our dean for research, Dr. Rob Gilbert. He, he provides administrative support to all our research programs, uh, all the activities, and is involved in, in setting the investment, priorities and investment in that research. Now he obtained his undergrad, master's degree from Purdue University, crop phys physiology, crop management. After that, I think, you know, Purdue realized they had a, they had a, they had a pretty good student there and they decided he they needed him to go to work for them. So he, he spent some years as a director of one of their research farms. He left there for a couple of years and went to work uh, in industry, working for a chemical company. And then he came back to Purdue and was uh, director of their eight, of Purdue's eight research farms. And then he was assistant director of the uh, uh, Purdue or, or Indiana experiment, agricultural experiment station. Uh, Jerry, you've been with IFAS for going on three years. And I will say, like I said, I've only, I've only been with IFAS for about 18 months. And when I've got a question for Gainesville, Jerry is usually the one I call to pick his brain and, and get information. So I consider Jerry not only to be an administrator that I report to, but I also consider him to be a good friend. Uh, next, we have Dr. Stephen Leong from uh, Florida A&M University. He is a professor an associate dean for uh, the uh, for dean for research for the university. He completed his undergraduate graduate degrees in agricultural economics at uh, Louisiana State University. He is now program director for the Evans, Allen, and McIntyre Stennis research programs, and he provides leadership and support to the research programs at the university at the College of Agriculture and Food Sciences. He uh, also to note, he is involved in giving students opportunities to get involved in research, uh, to give them an idea if that would be a good career track for them and I commend him for doing that. We need more people getting involved in agricultural research, field, field research in particular. Uh, he is working with FAMU industry partners to conduct research that will contribute to the development of the hemp of the industrial hemp industry here in the state of Florida. Now, we, the next uh, panelist was supposed to be Mike Kelly, president of Sunshine Hemp. Unfortunately, he had a situation, he's in Kentucky and had a situation where he had to cancel his, uh, his trip down here to speak to you. But in his place is uh, Jeff Sharkey. You've already heard his bio, president of the Florida Hemp Association. Uh, he's also, he's, he's very much aware of Sunshine, of Sunshine Hemp because he is a partner associate in the company. So he, he can speak for the research and the activities going on with uh, Sunshine, Sunshine Hemp. So we'll have him, I'm going to have each speaker come up and uh, give an overview of their programs, their research projects, and make any statements they'd like. And then I'm going to try to open up the floor to questions because I know many, many of you have questions for our participants. So we're going to start with Jerry Feinkauser. You can, uh, you can, you can either stay seated or come up here. I'll give you that choice. Good morning. My name is Jerry Feinkauser. I appreciate that illustrious uh, introduction. Glenn, I do appreciate that. On behalf of our senior vice president, Dr. Jack Payne, and our dean of research, Dr. Rob Gilbert, um, we are pleased to be here and to represent uh, one half of the pilot project effort here in the state of Florida. And I'm really impressed by the number of people in the room. It shows that, that the good people in this room are doing their homework. They're learning all they can about a potential crop. And uh, there's a lot of hype here. And it's good for us to understand what the realities are with a new venture like this. Uh, my background did include 27 years with Purdue Agriculture. The last three... Uh, involved administratively with the uh, Indiana Industrial Hemp Pilot Project. And so I not only got engaged with hemp production up in Indiana, but I grew up with hemp because I grew up in northern Indiana and we had this weed in the ditches we called ditch weed. And that was rope. 
back from World War I, and it grows in the Kankakee Valley Basin, south, uh, southeast of Chicago, and uh, it never bothered us too much. We could control it culturally. And so when we talk about invasiveness, we know, and I'm, I'm really jumping around, but I do want to touch on this, uh, hemp can be invasive, but it's been uh, managed very well by corn and soybean growers across the upper Midwest, the Corn Belt in particular. So I do want to mention that. Um, I was hired to support research, and I believe I spend 80% of my time now with industrial hemp in this pilot project. Um, I give an analogy. We came out of the rest stop, and we jumped into the fast lane on the interstate. Uh, we're not the first state to engage in the pilot project. We're one of the last under DEA permitting. We are, we are still currently permitted under uh, the federal DEA administration. Um, but we are working hard to begin to understand how hemp might fit in the state of Florida. Um, kudos to the Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services. You are all blessed to have FDACs. Um, they have not been given much time to come up with rules, to provide guidance to both Florida A&M and the University of Florida so we could get seed acquired, which is not easy, and get that seed in the ground and begin this research project. Um, our project is comprised of over 15 scientists, and I do want to acknowledge Dr. Josh Freeman. Josh, if you could raise your hand in the back of the room. He is the lead scientist at our North Florida Quincy location in the Panhandle. So we are doing research up and down the great state of Florida, but we are focused up here in the Panhandle, and that's where your interest is, not only at our Quincy location with active grow efforts, but also doing best management practice work at our West Florida location, located in Jay, east of Pensacola. Uh, FDAC's Office of Ag Water Policy has been supportive enough to uh, give us money for equipment. We just installed a linear irrigation system because to grow hemp in Florida, as you growers know, if you're involved in production agriculture, we're going to need to know some best management practices. So we are now going to move into that and get those BMPs established as soon as possible. Again, hats off to the uh, Department of Agriculture here in the state and Commissioner Freed for her leadership. So again, we have over 15 scientists that are engaged in the program. We have 12 or more permits. I say more, Eric, because I think we have one still pending. Um, those 12 permits include a, a federally permitted seed storage location and then two or three, maybe even four permits that are um, seed or plant tissue processing. And so one of the great things about being at the University of Florida is we not only have IFAS, the Institute of Food um, and Agricultural Sciences, but we have a medical school. So we have that component where we can enlist the expertise in our pharm pharmacology area to look at CBD and THC profiles and testing. So in case there's a question out there, who's doing our THC testing, we're doing that in-house with our good friends across, across campus in the School of Pharmacology. And if you've been to any of our workshops, you, you have seen that expertise do a great job talking about what we're seeing in the project and what we hope to uh, acquire and recommend onto our good friends at FDAX. What are we doing in the pilot project? We had three main objectives, and early on we had to look at the agronomics or the horticultural aspects of, of how hemp might fit in the state of Florida. We needed to evaluate as many hemp varieties uh, as we could acquire. And there again, I want to say thank you to companies like Greenpoint Research, uh, Green Roads. Um, Green Roads are our main corporate sponsor for the research contract that allowed this pilot project to happen. Other companies like uh, Greenpoint Research pr provided certified seed or plant material, a gift in kind, to really move our pilot project forward to look at the most diverse genetics as we could get early on. Now, once we had those genetics, we had to look at um, the type of systems. When you talk about hemp production, what kind of hemp are you talking about? CBD hemp will be grown a certain way, grain and fiber grown another way, and so we have to understand in our state with our sandy soils and our uh, existing infrastructure, how we were going to make uh, these systems work. And then you get to the invasiveness. We have great expertise in our institute. Dr. Luke Flory is heading up the invasive work. Hopefully that work will show what we probably know already, especially in the upper Midwest. There's invasiveness there, but if we can manage it and we have the proper security plan for plant material, seed dispersal, to remain on farm and follow up observation, we can keep this hemp where it needs to be, in the fields, and, and those products 
up and down the highway in controlled settings. That's the goal there. Um, what are we doing? We've had a first set of grows, um, four outdoor grow locations, uh, at least five indoor grow. Um, we are doing some applied work. When I talk about applied, that's very grower-focused information. But we're also doing something that's really lacking, and the gentleman in the blue shirt was touching on that. There is quite a lack of good science on hemp, the cannabis uh, sativa species itself. How are the effects of photoperiod with different genetics? What happens out in the field? Growing hemp in Florida is a lot different than growing hemp in northern Indiana. Our day length is much different. So we are investigating those type of effects, the day length, the temperature, uh, the humidity. Someone mentioned earlier um, this state suffers from plagues and pestilence. I've heard that uh, noted. Um, we are, we're a hot mess. We have higher humidity, higher nighttime temperatures, and so we are looking at this in controlled environments at our mid-Florida location, located in Apopka, and trying to get a handle on what you all as growers may see once these cultivation permits uh, go out the door, either late this year or early next year. We're also taking plant material and we're taking it into the lab on campus, doing THC and, TH and CBD testing. We want to see how those uh, percentages change over time um, with these diverse genetics from different companies. Is there a comfort level for you all as growers? I know there was some apprehension. If we can get a good understanding of the effects of drought stress, excessive heat and humidity on what I call THC creep, then we can uh, at least put that information out. And I should point out, it's very important that though the way statute came together in January of 2017 um, uh, provided us an opportunity to do a pilot project, we had to go find funding. It was not state funded. And so Green Roads was our sponsor, but we were able to do everything for op under an open science environment. So all this data, all this information that we're working hard to acquire it's going to be presented at workshops and get-togethers like this and ne the nearly seven uh, formal workshops we've done to date and the 30 media and other presentations that our team has done since the pilot project initiated. So I think I've rambled probably excessively, but hopefully I've captured some of those issues. I will speak on pollen drift in a little bit when we get to Q&A, but I do want to turn it over to our good friends at Florida A&M. Thank you. Thank you, Debbie. <clears throat> Good morning. My name is Stephen Leung, and uh, I represent uh, uh, Florida a &M University in its uh, industrial <coughs> hemp project. Uh, I, I don't want to say, but unfortunately, I don't have as much uh, to say as Jerry over here, uh, because they have been uh, in this project for quite some time. The approach that Florida a &M University has taken uh, in this industrial hemp project is a little different from uh, what uh, our sister university is doing in Gainesville. Uh, we have chosen to uh, take a slightly different route. Uh, in our research, we uh, have solicited the, uh, the support and collaboration of uh, industry partners. And uh, we have three industry partners that are involved in, in this project. And uh, one of them is right beside me here, uh, Sunshine Ham, represented by Dr. Jerry, uh, Jeb Shaki. Uh, we have another one called uh, Green Earth Canoceutical, and uh, the, our third partner is uh, Future Farm Technologies. Uh, I think the head office is in Canada. So we are working through these uh, three industry partners uh, to conduct our research. Uh, we just started our research, in fact. Uh, uh, it's about probably about two months old, so I really don't have that much information to share with you. Uh, about what is going on. But I'll tell you whatever that we have in mind and, and whatever information that we have here. The, uh, the projects are more, we have a seven, uh, what you call, approved permits uh, for our research projects and they are located uh, sort of uh, spread out in Florida. Uh, we have one site in, uh, in Tallahassee where we have about three acres and uh, we just recently planted about uh, 1,500 plants there on the site. Then we've got another site uh, in Newberry, uh, I think near Gainesville, and uh, we've got about 22,000 uh, plants, and some of them are still in the pots. 
And then we have the biggest site uh, that uh, is located in Bato, uh, where we have about uh, 40,000 plants already planted. And that's the older site uh, where the plants are about, uh, I think, seven to eight weeks old. And we've got four other sites that has, uh, that has been approved, but uh, we haven't planted anything yet. So that is the areas, I mean, those are the areas that we have planted, and we are working with our industry partners to uh, uh, collect the necessary data that uh, we hope in the near future to be able to share with growers and industry participants, <coughs> people like you, actually. We don't have as many people uh, working in the HAM project uh, as we would like to. Uh, we have got actually five people that are involved uh, in the project. We have got two entomologists, and I must find out that these are really experienced and good people, and they're working on IPM projects. We have got an agronomist, and we've got uh, agroforestry, and uh, we've got an agricultural economist. Not me, but uh, somebody else in the college uh, that, uh, that is working uh, with, uh, with me and, and the other faculty members uh, to try and collect as much information as possible uh, about the industrial hemp project. When we were trying to put together our research plans and we did uh, sort of uh, some amount of brainstorming, and, and uh, the reason is that uh, we need to find uh, some answers to the many questions that are being posed to us, and I think it is not surprising for me to mention that uh, there is an overwhelming uh, demand for information from growers, from all sorts of people out there in the community that wants to know uh, how to participate, what to grow, and so forth. And you can just imagine, at this point in time, we have so many questions and very little or no answers at all uh, to those questions. So we put together uh, our thinking cap and came up with three broad objectives that we think will satisfy uh, the questions that were posed to us in the Florida statute. And one of them is uh, to identify what are the varieties, uh, to do some form of varietal evaluation uh, that will be, uh, how shall I say, useful for people like you. Uh, we would like to identify the, the, the varieties that, uh, that will grow well under Florida condition. And uh, so we, we have uh, some of our partners working on that. Uh, unfortunately, because of limited resources, we did not look at a wide range of cultivars uh, that uh, our, my colleagues uh, at the University of Florida uh, are looking at. They look at 50 different varieties, I guess, uh, from fiber to uh, grain and CBD uh, uh, varieties. But in our case, uh, I think the plants that we have uh, put on the ground uh, are all uh, for the evaluation of CBD varieties. And uh, there are uh, five of them, actually, and not very many. And uh, these are the five promising varieties that our partners have said that uh, they think, based on their experience and knowledge, uh, will do very well here in Florida. So they are in Tallahassee area, uh, in the Gainesville area, near Newberry, and one in Bato. <coughs> The other areas uh, that we will be planting will be in Cannonsville and in Port Aguda. And I guess probably uh, Dr. Shaki here will be able to say a little bit <laughs> later on about uh, some of their plants. But I'm, I'm quite sure we may be looking at some of the other varieties as well, like uh, uh, the fiber varieties and also the grain varieties. Uh, so that's where we are right now. And uh, we are continuing to collect uh, necessary and useful information that uh, we hope uh, in the near future we will be able to share that uh, with the growers. Thank you. Okay. Jump right into this. Yeah, go right ahead, Jeff Sharkey. In case I haven't introduced myself, uh, <laughs> Jeff, Jeff Sharkey, uh, listen, it's, it's, a, uh, it's an honor to be here. I'm, I'm actually a designated hitter and substituting for, for Mike Kelly. Uh, who is uh, interesting as we're talking about this, the business of hemp. Uh, Mike um, uh, is the president of Sunshine Hemp. Uh, I, uh, I met him several years ago, and I'm going to give you a little background just very quickly. They, they've explained it. This industrial hemp research program you know, was passed by, le by Florida legislation in 2017, authorized by the 2014 Farm Bill, you know, long before this 2018 uh, bill passed, and really it was the only opportunity in Florida to move forward by federal law. We had to work with universities, with colleges of agriculture. That's why these two uh, university uh, uh, folks are, are here uh, back then. So when that passed, 
Senator Monford was a sponsor, Representative Masulo uh, from Citrus County, really believed it, passed that piece of legislation. And really the, the, the goal of that was to, was to develop industry partners to, 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 to identify varieties of hemp that would be sustainable. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go through Mike Kelly's presentation a little bit uh, and, and ensure that folks who you know, potentially could get into this business, and we didn't realize at that particular point in time that the 2018 would happen and 2019 would come along, uh, but I think it was prescient because we now have uh, these re research programs that are, that are looking at testing different genetic varieties of hemp, both on the CBD fiber seed side that will be available uh, to folks uh, who, uh, for Florida. A um, couple, just a, a quick, quick comment. Mike, uh, Mike Kelly, and I'm sorry he isn't here, he's much more inter interesting than I am on this topic. Uh, uh, Florida-based uh, sod uh, vegetable farmer uh, for 30 years out of St. Cloud, Florida, uh, was recruited to go to uh, Kentucky when they passed their 2014 farm bill uh, up there after the, after the federal bill passed. Uh, and worked with several folks who were out of Colorado and others and, and as the grower and the geneticist and grew one of the largest hemp uh, companies in America today over the course of three or four years. Kentucky, as you know, has a huge amount of activity going on. Uh, that particular company um, was, is probably the biggest in, in Kentucky. Mike came back to Florida when this industrial hemp research program passed and uh, we met and he talked about wanting to get back into Florida and doing this research on Florida soil. He's a, he's a Florida boy, uh, he's got better boots than I do and, and, uh, and is much more, much more knowledgeable. So, uh, as, as Dr. Leong pointed out, <clears throat> the idea behind that bill was to develop industry partners, was to develop partnerships with people who knew the hemp business, who had, who had done this obviously in some other state, uh, and uh, that was the approach FAMU took UF is using their outstanding IFAS program, the sponsored research program. They, he's mentioned their partners. So FAMU put out an ITN. They, uh, we had uh, 11, 11 responses, I think. No, we had about, uh, almost about 20, oh, 20, or 20 different. Uh, and so in that process, they evaluated who would be an effective partner, how would we utilize FAMU's faculty, uh, and, and identify this research, you know, the, the research uh, criteria that we went through. Uh, uh, Mike and his partners, and I've helped them out uh, move through this process, um, have, um, are very excited about moving forward. As you, may, as you can imagine, when the, when the 2018 Farm Bill passed and Florida passed the state hemp plan, there was a question about whether or not someone really needed to do the research. I mean, some of these folks know how to grow hemp in Kentucky, in Colorado, in Oregon, but really felt, uh, felt compelled to understand the value of what UF is doing and what FAMU is doing to really work in, in intensely on identifying various varieties, uh, various soil conditions, looking at invasive species, working closely with Department of Ag, um, and, and, um, and, I, and identifying not only the, the seed genetics, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about that, the, the, harvest, or the planting practices, uh, techniques, uh, drying, uh, cultivation, uh, mechanized harvesting, all sorts of practices uh, that would be beneficial for you to understand, you know, in, as, as, as this, as this uh, business moves forward in Florida. Um, so I'm sorry Mike's not here, and I, 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 hope, I hope he's listening in, but uh, he'll be, you know, the idea behind Sunshine Hemp and the other partners is to share that information, and certainly, certainly share the, share the, the uh, not only the information, the, the research, but uh, some of these seed genetics that I think they're going to develop. So let me just be, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about what we're doing. Um, we, uh, you know, the overall project goals are obviously to identify, cultivate, test, and quantify which hemp genetics and growing methods are suitable for Florida regions and climates. Um, I know we've all said that. Uh, it's, you know, evaluating planning techniques, uh, technical efficiencies of mechanized harvesting, crop drying, and stabilizing of biomass for storage, and really to look at the economic feasibility. All of you are interested in getting into this business. It's exploding around the country. Uh, the economics of it uh, are shifting, are changing. Uh, when, when, I, when people tell me that they're growing 30,000 acres in Montana, right? Well, what does that mean for, for Florida? Uh, the question, and, Flor and Florida has gotten, you know, kind of late to the game here. I think we've, we've talked about that in terms of this new state hemp program. And I asked Mike Kelly, who's, you know, maybe one of the better hemp, hemp cultivators, producers in the country, 
uh, Holly Bell had asked him, uh, you know, are we too late to the game? And he, and he said, listen, the research you're going to be doing is invaluable. That never happened before. I mean, farmers went out, tested out genetics, and tried things out. A lot of failure, right? Some successes, a lot of failure. He said, but because it's evolved, the genetics have evolved, the knowledge about planting has evol evolved since 2014, the players in the space, the networking, the processing opportunities, the technology has changed. Florida is in the right place at the right time. Uh, and from a guy who knows this business, uh, it's, it's, it's really good to hear. Um, one of the things uh, that uh, is important in all of this as well, and I think um, um, uh, Steve mentioned this morning, as did Eric, is the question of w where are you going to get seeds to grow? The state law requires certified seeds. Uh, I know that the Department of Ag has searched the country and internationally to identify where those certified seeds can be made available to folks who want to get into business in Florida. The state law uh, and federal law, but state law says, you know, you've got to find a, a certified seed uh, uh, association, organization. Uh, there are numbers of them around the, around the country. Not many have certified hemp seeds. And in addition to that, the, the research pilot programs can certify seeds as well. So that's beneficial for, I think, folks getting this business. They're going to get a little head start, right? They're, going to, they're starting this summer or this fall working on seed varieties and genetics, testing things out, and they will be making seeds available that have been you know, tested in Florida, uh, different kinds of genetic varieties, have, have the record keeping and data keeping that FAMU is requiring, you know, kind of a very intense data analysis, data record keeping. Uh, and all that is really beneficial for you who are saying, listen, I don't want, I don't want to start into this with out, eyes wide open without knowing, you know, uh, I mean, a lot of the, and, 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 and UF can testify to this. If you want to get a fiber seed from uh, Canada, it may not do well in Florida. If you want to get a uh, seed from Oregon, it grows well in Oregon. When you get it here and you get, and, and you know, you, you, it's, 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 it's a feminized seed, um, but statistically a portion of that are going to be male seeds. So if you're new in this and you get out there and start planting all these seeds and all of a sudden you've got males that you didn't, didn't expect uh, and a variety you didn't know about, uh, the, 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 per, the percentage and probability of, of potential failure is higher. So that's one of the focuses obviously of Sunshine Hemp is to, is to work towards certifying seeds. So they've spent a lot of time with the Department of Ag to ensure that both, that both all of these research programs can provide those to interested farmers, right? Uh, so let me just mention a couple of things. So Sunshine Hemp has got two, two research plots, one in, uh, one in Keenansville, uh, Florida, which is outside of St. Cloud, uh, and another uh, in Punta Gorda, Florida, uh, and Mr. Kelly and his colleagues, uh, I'm gonna talk about who's on that team, um, have, are, are leasing 100,000 square foot uh, former uh, vegetable uh, cooling facility, packing facility, and they're starting this week uh, with, uh, with these seed varieties, growing them indoors, testing five to seven different varieties, uh, and uh, will, uh, I've been told, uh, have, um, have those, those plants, will be grown, started indoors, grown outdoors on a two acre plot, uh, and then have uh, test results, research back, and seeds available by January. Uh, so that's, that's a fast track, and they're testing if all of you who know this business better than I, they're testing the normal photo period hemp plants that are grown in Kentucky, and we can talk a little bit more about that in the Q&A, but also auto flowering plants, which can flower uh, you know, every 75 days, not dependent on, on uh, uh, photo periods, which are critical for flowering and CBD, uh, but hybrid plants. Uh, and, and the reason that I think they're, they're, they're able to do that is they're working with a with, a, with a, a seed company out of Oregon uh, called Phytonics, which is, uh, work, is probably the largest, one of the largest seed banks, uh, cannabis seed banks in the country, uh, have, have uh, I've been told, thousands of different seed varieties for different climatic conditions, whether it's Colombia, whether it's Spain, whether it's Kentucky, whether, so Mike has been working with them to identify uh, seeds that are a high probability of, 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 of viability and success in Florida. Uh, 
on this whole certified seed issue, and I want, this is important for all of us, and I, I know the frustration that, that Stephen and, and, and the ag folks have, the Florida law said you have to use a certified seed. No other state is doing that. One of the things I know Commissioner Freed wants to do is to develop this fresh from Florida, high quality, branded certified product. That's a market differentiator for you versus someone who's growing in Alabama, Tennessee. So the idea behind that certification really originally was, from the legislature was, let's make this the highest quality, best product possible. Right? Um, and, and so folks at Phytonics are actually in another industrial hemp research project in Oregon with Oregon State University on a seed, one of the first certified seed planting seed programs. So their seeds have been tested by OSU. They've got these varieties. So we're, you know, Mike, uh, Mike has, done his, has done his due diligence. And so they are partnering with uh, Sunshine Hemp to provide those, provide those varieties. Uh, we can talk a little bit more uh, about some of the certified seed stuff. Uh, I, um, I don't want to bore everybody by going through the actual research protocols, but it's pretty, you know, it's pretty extensive. And, and the folks who know this business like you out there um, are really going step by step by step uh, to test these varieties indoors, grow them, germination plans, floral periods at a certain period, um, compliance and monitoring, testing constantly, record keeping along the way. Um, and I can, I, I don't want to, again, I can, I can read Mike's presentation, but uh, I don't want to bore you with that. So um, why don't we leave it at that, open it up for some, some, some questions. I, I think, um, I, will, I will say the, the, the permit requirements that Eric mentioned for this industrial hemp research program uh, are, are very extensive. And uh, 13 different categories, and there's a lot of issues uh, that have to be covered uh, to tell them exactly how you, not just contamination and, and um, containment, but right. And so in, in talking, talking to Mr. Kelly and, and others who are as experienced as him, some of you are in this room, uh, I'll, let me just finish with this. This, this. this research program is really designed to improve the percentage of success for Florida growers. As you can imagine, and I think Mr. Holly Bell will mention today, not only is this an indication of the interest, they're anticipating 3,000 applications, right, for permits. That's a lot, all of the state. A lot of those, a lot of interest, you know, actually, you know, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of uh, resources, not a lot of experience. So the key to this is we tell people, and Mr. Kelly's, you know, mantra is, get a plan, right? Understand the entire, from seed genetics, to soil, the harvesting, all the technology involved, the production, the distribution, where are you gonna sell it? Um, and I, we'll talk later about processing bottlenecks and everything in Florida and how, how we resolve that. But, um, so the application permit may be fairly easy, and I think it's, it's helpful that they've done that. But as you get into this, and I think this is helpful as part of this, this program, is really develop a plan for yourselves, right? So that you can utilize the research gained from, from these research programs, and there'll be other universities getting involved. Um, but also from the business community uh, who have, have done this in other states uh, and, 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 and build a program that you feel has a high probability of success. Uh, and I, uh, last comment, I think Ms. Bell will mention, um, you know, Tennessee's got a program, Kentucky's got a program, they're kind of the southern states that, you know, the, the number of people who have, fa who have applied for permits but not, not uh, successfully planted or cultivated is, is in the 60% range. Right? Uh, for a variety of reasons. So what, what we want to make sure is in Florida when we get this program running is, is, uh, is every one of you has the highest probability of success possible. So, and we want to thank FAMU. FAMU has been great to work with. I've got to tell you, they've been, it's been super helpful and Dr. Leong has been a great partner and uh, we look forward to using their faculty, internships for students, working with small and minority businesses, et cetera. So, if I may add something here, yeah, I think I right. failed to mention that all our research right now are being conducted uh, off station, or off campus uh, sites actually, and uh, like uh, Dr. Shaki just said, uh, we are using his site uh, to collect data and so forth, but ultimately I think, uh, in fact it is within our plan to also establish our own research facility uh, in our station, and that will be in Quincy, and we are working on that, so uh, because we believe that uh, we need to have our own 
uh, research facility to be really uh, focus on some of the more uh, advanced research uh, that are needed to yeah. provide the necessary information to the industry. You know, as, 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 as Dr. Krakhauser mentioned, you know, the, the, there was no money provided for in that 2017 legislation. I mean, this is a public-private partnership. And as he mentioned, private partners came and helped funded them. I mean, Sunshine Hemp is paying for the, the entire project, helping with faculty, internships, et cetera. So, I mean, they're taking a risk as well. But I think they believe very, 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 very confidently that this is going to be a viable and successful business in Florida. Okay, let me, before we get started, let, let me add uh, something about Kentucky. Uh, some of you might be asking, why is Kentucky ahead of us? And you got to understand that uh, at the time that hemp was banned, federally banned in the 70s, early 70s, I believe, uh, Kentucky led the country in hemp production. And so when Colorado decided to run their experiment in legalizing recreational marijuana, a lot of families in Kentucky were suddenly saying, hey, we can go back to growing hemp. It didn't work out that way. It wasn't that quick. But understand Kentucky, when they started their program about eight years ago, there wasn't a lot of funding, not near the funding that we're seeing here in Florida. And they spent two or three years uh, kind of struggling, that program was. The Kentucky Department of Agriculture uh, struggled. Now it's going strong, but they got ahead of us, but I don't think they're that far ahead of us. I think, I think uh, our research initiative, uh, I'm biased in saying this, but it's, it's ahead of the game as far as I'm concerned, comparing it to Kentucky. Uh, so before we start, with the Q&A session, how many of you are interested, how many of you are growers interested in growing hemp? Can I see a show of hands? Okay, quite a few. How many of you processing? Okay, that's good to know. I felt like uh, there were some questions asked, uh, again, the gentleman in the blue shirt in the last session that probably should be asked in this session, but... Uh, Anyway, we will open up the floor now to any questions you may have. I uh, got this gentleman right, right here. Hey there. Um, <clears throat> just wondering what kind of research has been done for um, different varieties for CBD content um, through the uh, research programs. To, to, to me. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, as I mentioned earlier on that uh, uh, currently we are looking at uh, evaluating some of the most promising varieties of uh, hemp for CBD e extraction actually and they are being evaluated right now. As I also mentioned earlier on that uh, we haven't even completed the first cycle so uh, we know how the plants are growing and so far we are taking observations and data from it but we don't have the cannabinoids uh, profile yet. Uh, in fact, we haven't evaluated the level of THC and the CBD content yet. But I think that will be done pretty soon, uh, you know, in, to my knowledge. So once we do that, uh, right now, like I said, we mentioned we have five varieties. Uh, one of them is uh, uh, what you call uh, ox bow. Uh, we have uh, citrus wine, uh, cherry wine. Uh, we have got uh, CBD therapy and another name selection that uh, we are evaluating. And they were highly recommended by our partners and saying, by, by saying that uh, these are the most promising based on our extensive experience and knowledge. So we go with that. And like I said earlier, one of the reasons why we chose these partners is because of their knowledge and experience in the ham industry. From the University of Florida standpoint, we are looking at CBD profiles. Um, as many of you may have heard, there's over 113 that with, uh, products that have been documented in, in the hemp plant. And we're looking at eight to 10 of the most common CB, uh, CBDG, uh, those type of metabolites, uh, with a focus on CBD. And uh, Dr. Uh, Josh Freeman is looking at this over time at the North Florida location at Quincy. Um, we got a certificate of, of authorization from the parent material from which these plants came from when these, seed, these seeds or plant material came into the state of Florida. And the profiles that we received from the parent material uh, ranged from 6 to 8% um, in a field setting. And the majority of our live plant material came from states uh, like Colorado and North Carolina. In fact, I think all of it did. And so 
I don't have the, the spreadsheet in front of me. Uh, that would be something I would encourage you to visit with Dr. Freeman in the back of the room. He might be able to provide more insight on what we're seeing. We're just now getting this data and we're moving uh, live, live and desiccated plant material from our grow locations to Gainesville to the School of Pharmacology to do these analysis. Um, I think we'll have much more on this at our November 21st Ag Expo event at the Gulf Coast Research and Education Center. Um, we're going to bring in our friends from the Kentucky Department of Agriculture and North Carolina Department of Agriculture. Uh, Holly Bell will be there. And we're going to hopefully at that time have more definitive information on what we're seeing um, with our genetics that we're looking at. We have some similar genetics, cherry wine wife, ACDC, upwards of 15 different CBD hemp varieties that we have in our trial. And uh, you might be able to get a copy of that by going online at our pilot project website. Just uh, search online uh, UF Hemp Pilot Project and when you get to the home page, look under resources, you'll get a PowerPoint and about slide number eight or 10 is our list of varieties. And we're broke out of third CBD, third grain fiber and dual purpose. Um, so I don't have a really good answer, but um, it, it's important for us to see that creep up. And I'm going to deviate here, but, but we're also following THC because there's some preliminary evidence that, uh, in some conditions that that THC may be creeping up, but then coming back down uh, as long as the plants are healthy, very close to harvest. And that's a one-time observation with a particular cultivar. So we really got to get a handle and do more experiments to see is that what we're really going to see out in a field setting. Um, Dr. Larry Smart at Cornell University has a wonderful industrial hemp pilot project up there. I was up there a week and a half ago. We were talking about THC creep and how this might impact Florida growers like yourself. Um, he thinks that that THC creep upwards towards 0.3% um, by dry weight of total Delta 9 THC may be, may be more genetically related than environmentally. And that's good news for us in Florida, right? So if we can understand the genetics, if we can breed our way to a low THC um, cultivar or a set of genetics under all conditions, that, that's where you really want to go for our Florida growers um, across the state and up in the panhandle. So uh, a really long answer to a simple question. So let, hopefully it helps. If I, if Thank you. Let's, uh, let's do I? this. When you ask a question, give us your name yeah. and what your interest, be it farmer, or what company you represent, or what your interest <laughs> might be. Can, can, I, can, I, can I just respond? I'm going to sound much smarter than I really am, but I was going to tell you, because this is essential to the sunshine of Mike Kelly. I'm just going to give this, the, the criteria they're using to select these seeds. So it's, you know, cannabinoid production, number one, selecting high, T, high CBDA, low THC synthase, 31 ratios. Uh, terpene production, long-term stabilization of desired terpenes. For those of you who know what they said, you'll know what it is. Photo period, which is different in Florida than elsewhere, you know, obviously. Onset of flowering as early as 15 light hours with 15 to 26 day maturation for early harvesting. They're looking at auto flowering and hybrid auto flowering as well. Vigor and resilience, selecting for pathogen and predator resistance, important for the invasive species pieces. Um, Biomass yield, selecting flower structure and plant morphology combinations fundamental to maximizing yield per square foot. Regional specificity, identifying variants better suited to regional ranges of photo period, temperature, rainfall, humidity, as well as a 92% germination rate. You know, I think that's important as you get into this. Uh, and, and I think what Sunshine Hemp is, you know, what we'll have to do at some point is not only on the seed development, but on the cultivar development, you know, certified cultivars. So you, 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 if you get that, you're sure not to get any males, right? So you get a feminized uh, uh, seedling. I mean, that's, I did sound smarter than I am, but that's. <laughs> okay, next, next question there. Glenn Moon, I'm hoping to be a grower. We're uh, interested to know more about clones and why they're not permitted, and also uh, feminized seeds. They're not 100% where clones can be. And then will you permit farmers to clone their own plants to continue process? Um, I, I can take a stab. And, and, and so your question speaks to uh, probably bringing live plant material into the state, clones ready to either go into shade house or directly into the field. Um, that's a question probably better answered by our good friends at FDAX. Um, but there's some real reasons. Um, you probably all have heard that we brought plant material in to try to speed up the progress of our research. And along uh, with those plants came little pests, either in an egg form or whatnot. So there's some real challenges with bringing larger plant material into the state. And I think um, some of the rulemaking is geared towards ensuring 
um, the safety and security of, of hemp production in the state, trying to minimize the number of outbreaks. Once you have russet mites, you have russet mites. You talk to the medical marijuana growers and they're battling russet mites. And so if you can start out with clean material, you'll increase your probability of ending up with a marketable crop that's not pest damaged, not stressed. And stress will reduce uh, levels of CBD if you're growing CBD hemp. Um, but it also may create a situation where that THC starts to creep. So pest issues are probably one of those driving reasons for why live plant material um, is being restricted. I think there are some mechanisms, but again, that is a question, uh, unless Jeff wants to take it or Dr. DeLong, um, uh, I, would, I would defer to, to our friends at FDAX. And I, I will get to your pollen drift question whenever, um, but okay. does anyone else want to take that? <laughs> um. Dr. Leong, would you like to add to that? In fact, uh, yeah, I can add a little bit more. Uh, in our research project, uh, we, uh, we didn't have time because of the, the what you call, question of timeliness and how the plants are going to uh, perform. Uh, we brought in the cuttings, actually, the rooted cuttings or, or liners, uh, as you may call them, actually, and uh, we did observe initially uh, the presence of mites and aphids there, uh, but they are all under control. So, uh, you know, the, the chances of you bringing in or importing some of those undesirable bugs uh, into Florida uh, is always there. And that is why I think I, I failed to mention earlier on that uh, one of our major uh, projects that, that we are doing here right now is uh, uh, to try and identify and develop some very effective, uh, what you call, biocontrol, uh, you know, non-chemical strategies to control uh, these pests here. And that's why I did mention we have two entomologists that are seriously looking into it, and uh, even we are trying to put up traps and so forth to try and monitor uh, their presence and, and how best we can uh, control this problem. Actually. So, and the other thing that we probably need to also understand is that, uh, as you are maybe well aware, is that uh, uh, cannabis or hemp is highly photosensitive. Uh, when we first brought the plants here, actually, uh, from Kentucky, actually, and uh, we have to give them additional lightings uh, just to sustain the vegetative growth because we started to observe that uh, they were all beginning to flower and uh, getting into the reproductive stage. So after we gave them a couple of weeks of, of lightings, and they begin to uh, you know, take on the vegetative characteristics. And then uh, after a week or so, we put them into the field. So uh, that's something that we need to remember and, and keep that in mind, actually. They're highly photosensitive. Very good. I, I guess I'm also interested in, in uh, understanding, is this, are we moving towards uh, nurseries being able to clone Florida? Yeah, once you've got your, once you've got your uh, your variety set up, are we going to have people in the business to yeah. sell clones? I just say clones mostly because we're not dealing with any fertilization. And that's obviously when you're growing the oil, that's the goal. So right. feminized seeds do not work as well as clones. One of the understandings that, uh, one of the understandings that we have with our industry partners, uh, like Dr. Jaffe, uh, Shaki here, is that uh, uh, other than their proprietary rights and so forth, that any research information that uh, we acquire uh, or that we collect uh, from the research projects uh, is uh, in the public domain, that uh, you know, the, the, the professors or, or the faculty involved in the research projects uh, will be able to make uh, uh, use of those data for their research presentations and uh, share that with the, uh, the general public, actually. And it will be uh, in publications like Jeffrey journals or whatever uh, you know, media that, that uh, we think may be uh, suitable or appropriate for, for public use. Another question? My name is Lee Mark from uh, Pura Vita Farms. In regards to where you're growing these plants in real world locations and testing, is there going to be available on a website or something a map showing these real-world testing locations? And is there going to be a brief synopsis of each growing cycle showing what your results were? Uh, yeah, unfortunately, I mean, we, we do have a map here. When I gave my, my presentation to the Senate Agriculture Committee, we have a map showing where the, the sites are, the location of the, uh, the research projects are going on. 
Uh, unfortunately, right now we don't have a site on FAMU website where we are able to show or, or put all this information. Maybe sometime in the near future we will try to work something out and have it available. Well, since the weather's different from all parts of the state and the soil and everything else like that, how many actually real-world testing sites are you planning on using? Well, we have seven uh, uh, approved licenses right now, uh, licenses that, that uh, we plan to uh, have uh, research going on. And maybe, in, again, I guess, sometime in the 2020, we may increase that to 10. Uh, one of the major limiting factors uh, is the, uh, what they call, our limited resources uh, that FAMU has. Uh, we, uh, unfortunately, do not receive any kind of uh, state funding for our research. Uh, the state only provides the university funds for our teaching programs and, and all our research uh, has to come, the funding will have to come from uh, other sources, uh, from external sources. And okay, so we one have last question. Our, sorry? One last question. If a farmer wanted to present a plot of land to you to use as a research project at no cost per se for your research, would we be able to do that? Uh, right now, I can't answer in the affirmative, but that's something that we can think about or, or talk it through because the final decision will have to come uh, through my university leadership team. Uh, in this particular case that we are having right now, our industrial hemp project, we have a contractual arrangement with three of our partners. So uh, there are many other farmers that have come forward and wanting to grow hemp with us and so forth. So unfortunately, we are not able to, uh, to go along with that because the decision to participate with these three partners uh, uh, was made by our board of trustees. So it was made at a very high level uh, to, to get involved uh, in the HEM project. Thank you. I'd like to take a stab at, at the University of Florida perspective. Um, you can go online and see where our growth sites are. Um, all of our sites are University of Florida uh, managed properties. The state of Florida actually owns all university properties. Um, and that can be uh, found easily on our pilot project website. The reason we're only doing pilot project work on um, University of Florida properties on, on this initial phase, this two-year pilot project, was by the time we presented our information to the Board of Trustees and we showed them a DEA permit that says we're working with a controlled substance, this was prior to uh, President Trump signing the, the 2018 Farm Bill, and we showed them our bonding license, and everyone in the room gets nervous, right? And so. Um, it was thought that the best course of action um, moving into this new potential crop was to keep control of it. And so it is at our uh, research and education centers up and down the state. Real world conditions, we're on that rocky soil down at Homestead, we're up on this heavier sand uh, up here uh, just 30 minutes west of this room where we're at today at Quincy at our North Florida Research and Education Center. Dr. Glenn Aikens, the center director, uh, not only for that site but Suwannee Valley. Um, and Mariana, and then at J, which is that heavier soil getting farther out in that panhandle. And not only do we have those locations, but we uh, intentionally work to get seed from China overseas at about a latitude that, of adaptability to the panhandle. That took seven months and a lot of discussions with U.S. Customs and Border, but we got that seed in. And that's to give us a good representation of how the industrial hemp on the grain and fiber side might perform in the panhandle, and we're seeing some positive results. All the weather information, grow information, will be online, will be presented not only at workshops um, over the course of the next year or two, but also um, at that November 21st Florida Ag Expo. Um, and the second question, refresh me on what that second, uh, oh, can you get involved? The oh, question the was, farmers, um, can you growers get involved in pilot projects? Um, obviously in phase one, this two-year pilot project, um, our authority does not allow us to engage on private grow efforts, but once these cultivation permits are issued from FDACs, um, our scientists, if the funds are there, will are actively looking and will be looking for partnerships to get on farms so we can get a more representative sample on how industrial hemp does um, everywhere from Jay, Pensacola on down to Homestead. Uh, because, you know, small scale studies are just that. They're going to provide some good specific information, enhance what we know about industrial hemp, but we got to get a broad look at this. And we got to troubleshoot and work together. And we're going to do in service training with our extension staff and IFAS um, here in early December 
and equip our extension field agents with the tools to help you all as growers as part of our land grant mission as these cultivation permits, I guess 3,000 of them at least, go out the door. So we're ramping up, uh, but at this time we cannot get on grower fields with our initial pilot project effort. Okay, next Phil question. Calandra, my, my, I'm looking for production information. Um, we've had pretty much had a drought for the last three months, and I wonder if you could talk to irrigation, water consumption, and planting density. Uh, I could, I'll take a quick stab at it. I just don't want to go on and on. Um, irrigation, we think, is going to be needed, especially on the CBD hemp side, on the vast majority of any uh, outdoor type grow, and, and an indoor year, obviously, going to be in irrigation. Uh, we're currently, um, uh, for the most part, on outdoor and um, a raised bed drip system. Um, here in Florida, we're near three days away from a drought. Um, you're going to need to prepare for that and keep these plants in a healthy state and make sure you have the horsepower there, either on the nutrition um, and, and or uh, on the water state of that plant for optimum growth. Um, and so you talk about the stress of the lack of water, um, that is real, that is a threat. So if you're growing large scale, um, either a large traveling gun, center pivot, linear system, or if you have the infrastructure going raised beds, um, we're doing that at Quincy on plastic for weed control and moisture conservation. Um, we're also gonna be engaging in the use of uh, all crop label fumigants um, for that um, under plastic, and that'll be done hopefully early spring, spring next year, to try to get a handle on uh, enhancing that weed control in addition to providing um, that irrigation uh, fed through drip line. If I may add to that, I guess, uh, I think we haven't done this research yet. Uh, based on our literature review, uh, soil moisture and soil temperature is, uh, they are very critical in terms of uh, hemp cultivation because uh, uh, without that you will have a hard time uh, in germinating your seeds in the field and at the same time weed control will be a major problem once, uh, you, as you always know that the weeds will always outgrow your, your crop uh, if you give them a chance actually. So, uh, you have to take that into consideration. In our research projects right now, uh, all the fields are being irrigated because they are looking at the CBD uh, aspect of it. So uh, I think if they are going into uh, fiber production, I think that may be something different. But because of the high value of CBD, uh, I think it is worth their while to make sure that the fields are well irrigated and uh, uh, what you call taken care of. We have time for a couple more questions. Yes, my name is Josephine Crail. Um, in the FDAC's proposed rules, it states that the THCA levels will need to be calculated into the total THC content for hemp. And I'm wondering if the research projects are um, tracking THC le THCA levels in the varietals that you all are growing to ensure um, that 0.3% is, is uh, you know, kind of stayed at. That's a great question, and even a better question for Erin Berthold, which is in, uh, she is a, a postdoc in our School of Pharmacology. We're looking at total Delta 9 THC, and at this point I'd like to defer to Dr. Josh Freeman in the back of the room. Maybe he can, uh, can you? Yeah, so what Dr. Freeman's saying is we're looking at, yeah. at that major profile, we're looking at the, the acidic part. Uh, there is a calculation of, of the Delta 9 um, and then times that 0.877, I believe, times the, the uh, carboxyl uh, component. And, and so that gives you your total Delta 9 THC. And, but um, I'm an administrator, which is much, much worse than a biochemist, <laughs> so. Next question. Um, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, I, my question is, after the destruction of Hurricane, after the destruction of Hurricane Michael and seeing the devastation and the impact that it left on the actual buildings and homes, is Hemp Creek in the near future of being able to be used to build infrastructures of homes and commercial um, dwellings and buildings. Um. I, oh. I, let me, I, 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 
again, I'm not an expert, but I've spent a lot of time <clears throat> looking at the various you know, uh, product options and, and talking to uh, folks who are, you know, are, who are in this business, in the space, obviously heavy into the CBDs, and that, that whole range of cannabinoids. Fiber, you know, we've had a lot of conversations about fiber for textiles. There's some folks here in the room, we're gonna talk about that a little later, we're working on that. Uh, we've had, you know, there's, there's a couple of folks in Florida that are very focused on, on hempcrete. Um, you know, part of it is the process, we, once you grow it and decorticate it and, and pro process, get the, get the, get the, the uh, fiber and mixture ready to go. Uh, most of the extraction technologies out there and processing technologies are really focused on, on oil production. Uh, we're, we're working hard on uh, looking at um, attracting uh, fiber production and, 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 uh, and facilities that would, that would create enough of that uh, fiber uh, to, for hempcrete. Uh, there's a lot of interest, I mean, it, it, it has, it's, it's there. So if you want to take the lead on this, it'd well, be great. We well, we currently use EF block. Um, we've um, built a, sure. a model home on Tuske with Tuskegee University. And so we started doing the comparison of the EF block, the earth friendly block, and the hempcrete. And they're pretty much the same. Um, but since we're going into the hemp, Industry. Correct. I was just wondering, you know, because it's hurric, you know, it, it withstands the uh, hurricane winds, yeah. the mold retardant, as well as yeah. um, fire yeah. resistant. Yeah. So yeah. I was just wondering yeah. if that was something. There's that a gentleman by the name of Bob Clayton, who's you know, he's evangelical about this, and he, uh, he may be here today. But uh, Bob has been, you know, uh, you know, a voice in the wilderness for years on, on hempcrete, and he's got a hemp house, hempcrete house, he's built. Uh, so I would be happy to connect you. And, and then I know the Department of Ag and Holly are, are looking at a lot of these different options. Um, because it, you know, it, it, people at the end of the day, this, this CBD market you know, is exploding. We get benchmark spot pricing reports every month on what nationally what it looks like. You know, these, you know the, pr the pricing for a kilo of CBD oil has dropped you know, by you know, a quarter. Uh, over the last four months, it's all kind of expectations. Uh, but the folks in the business, see, you know, see fiber and these other product lines is really, you know, long-term sustainability. So uh, everybody keep their eyes open, and we'll, you know, we're all trying to, you know, provide these, you know, success options. So. If I may add, uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, I think if you look up in the internet, uh, people have been telling me, uh, you know, there are 25,000 uses for hemp. Uh, the internet says there are 50,000 uses for hemp. Uh, so, I don't know, so it looks like uh, there's a lot of almost uh, unlimited uh, applications for hemp, but I don't want to spread rumors, but rumor has said that uh, somebody is uh, looking into establishing uh, a textile, uh, hemp textile uh, industry in the Jacksonville area, so I may be wrong in this, and also that somebody in Florida is looking into establishing a factory uh, for conversion of uh, hemp into plastic, so, uh, you know, these are rumors that I hear. So I may be wrong, but hopefully they are true, and so that will expand the, the market demand and the industry base. Okay. So if anybody out there with the money, we got the projects for you. Right? I, I do know some research done in Kentucky has shown that hemp makes a very, very strong fabric, very strong. So it's, it's canvas-like, maybe even stronger than canvas, though. So. Um, we've got still a few minutes. I would like to ask Jerry Fankhauser to talk about pollen drift. We've got one more question. This woman's been waiting. Well, okay. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. My name is Bobby Golden. Uh, I have a farm uh, just 35 miles east of here. My interest in, in hemp is for fiber, and I'd like to know if there is just a season or if we in Florida can raise hemp year-round or if there's any research being done on that. Okay, so from the IFAS pilot project standpoint, we're looking at um, all three types of hemp uh, up and down the state. Um, certainly when you look at the CBD uh, outdoor um, and the grain and fiber side in South Florida, uh, if you have adaptable cultivars, uh, they're looking at possibly two grows a year, a fall and then kind of a, a spring. Um, in an outdoor setting, maybe even three. Um, that's all going to depend on refining the system and having adapted varieties. Up here in the panhandle, um, hemp is an annual crop. Uh, it is cold sensitive, um, which is a competitive advantage for us in Florida because um, my family farms in northern Indiana. Most of the equipment goes in the shed at the end of October. Doesn't come back out till May. Uh, we planted in snow flurries up there in May. 
Um, we have a competitive advantage. If we can find the adapted cultivars, maybe we can get one and a half grows or at least a solid one grow up in the panhandle. Um, on the CBD side, um, maybe with auto flowering or day neutral where you're not dependent on that length of darkness for the growth, um, maybe there is that possibility up in this part of the world, um, 850, right? 850, um, to get that kind of growth. Um, but that's why that work we're doing at Quincy under the leadership of Dr. Josh Freeman is important. And uh, if you all are going to be doing work up here, I don't know if you want to comment um, what that potential is. Well, I guess there's always great potential in him, and that's one of the reasons why the university decides to, uh, to join in and make a contribution to the growth of a sustainable industry. Uh, again, we don't have direct uh, research data to be able to make any strong recommendation or assertion, but if, well, I base uh, my information on the literature search that I look at, uh, and if you talk about fiber production from hemp, uh, usually they report that uh, a farmer will get approximately about $480 to $500 per acre or so. And if you check it again and see how much income or profit you're going to make from CBD production, and the range is immense, it's almost unbelievable. They will say that a farmer can get about $2,000 per acre to $75,000 per acre. I don't know how true it is, but uh, you know, it gives you an idea about uh, the variability and you never can tell for sure you know, what is the truth and what is fiction. So uh, just to give you some idea why people are all lining up to try and grow hemp for CBD. I think what's positive and what could happen, and it goes back to what uh, Mr. Sharkey said, if we can get a fiber industry to develop a processing plant in this part of the world, there will be a great opportunity. Because I, I view this whole fiber side kind of like ethanol production in the upper Midwest. You look at ethanol production and the majority, 80% of that field corn production in a 20 to 30 mile um, radius around that ethanol plant ends up coming to that ethanol plant. And so if the industry locates here in Florida, um, we've got the expertise. You all, if you have the adapted cultivars on the fiber side, it can grow in this part of the world. There's, there's no doubt. And we'll make every best effort to get that science out there and to support that growth. But certainly getting someone to invest and, and siting a plant here, because it's very costly to move fiber, you know, move that bulk material uh, very far, just like for ethanol production. And, and so that's how I kind of see that playing out. I think, to my knowledge, there's only one certified uh, hemp uh, variety for, for fiber, actually, and that is a variety called Elite that was uh, developed in Colorado. Let's have one last question right there. I know you've been waiting for a long time. Uh, my name is Michael Brown. I live in right down the road in Gaston County, Quincy. I'm a real live farmer. My question is, I'm saying I want to grow him. Now, I'm looking at that picture up there, looking at that machine right there. That machine, I know what a combine costs. So, I'll be a startup person. I always, my family always grew to, thank you. My family always grew tobacco, so I know what it takes to grow tobacco. Even right now, I grew the last crop of tobacco in Gaston County in 2006. So, it's kind of like when somebody said they want a farm, they think they want a farm because if you're not born into it, you got to go buy a trike that costs sixty thousand dollars. You got to get you some land. You got to lease. I'm saying real life situations like a person like me. So for me, I'm saying I haven't been to meetings, but right in Gaston County, you probably got the biggest marijuana rap, rap next door to me. I pass it every day, and they study building. I'm like, my goodness, I missed that. Couldn't get in on that. I wasn't big enough. So I was just trying to come here today. That's why I took time out. I need to be on my tractor right now. But I took time out to come here today, so I'm seeing real life situation. Now, I'm looking at this picture right here, that piece of equipment, about $300,000. So I'm saying, I want to grow hemp, maybe I might not. So I'm wondering, is it going to be something like somebody like me, startup? Now, I got tractors, a couple of hundred acres of land. Like I said, we grew tobacco. Right now, I still got bonds on my farm. Tobacco is gone. I mean, it's gone. But we were very successful in growing. So for me, this would be a good avenue for me. But I'm wondering, okay, I'm saying I'm going to grow hip. This is a real life situation. Y'all, I'm listening to y'all telling me about the seeds, how we get this stuff. So I'm saying, nah, I'm going to grow hemp. How am I going to pick this stuff? Do I need irrigation? That piece of equipment, do I harvest it by hand? Do I grow it like you grow oats? Do you grow it like I know by growing tobacco? Do I plant it 24 inches apart, 12 inches apart? I know to a damn how much it takes to grow tobacco. 
And I'm also nobody has said, what did this stuff bring a pound? I mean, is it seven dollars a pound, two dollars a pound? I don't even know. So I'm just saying, I want to grow hemp. Maybe I don't. So, thank you. That's my question. <laughs> Jerry, would you like that one? Yeah. Wow. Let me just, uh, um, Jerry, well, can I, let me just, it, let me it, go, it, let me yeah, go ahead. I, and I, <laughs> I didn't mean to interrupt you, but uh, very legitimate, very you know, business question, obviously, on, on, on this. And so if you, if you look at how other states have approached this, because we're starting on this, very good question. How do small farmers, you know, really get into this business? How do they afford this equipment? How do they process? I mean, what's this whole plan? And what you'll find in Kentucky, Tennessee, and, and, and Colorado, so much Oregon, um, but, but, but Kentucky, Tennessee are pretty good models. And, 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 and I know that Ms. Bell was going to talk about providing, you know, e kind of education, tutorials, information to farmers like you. Like, what are the basics here? What do I really need to know about? How do I, where do I get resources to help me understand how far apart these plants have got to be planted? What's the irrigation process? But, 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 but the, the business model uh, that I've seen in, in Kentucky is there are a lot of small farmers yeah. and, and, they, and they plant it and harvest it by hand. I mean, five yeah. acres, 10 acres. I mean, it, you know, it's seasonal, obviously. And then some, or somebody will come in with just like, you know, and with a, with a, with a harvester, you know, an expensive harvester. You pay X, they'll take it Y, they'll take it to the, you know, you take it to a processing plant and they'll give you X for what you've got, right? That, that, that industry isn't, isn't here in Florida yet. But uh, you know, enterprising people will figure out how to how to get you know set up pieces of this. Um, I think the first thing is you know how do you grow it? What's the business model? If I grow five acres, what's the yield? What's what's how do, if it, if, is it a yield in fiber? Is it a yield in CBD raw oil? Is it a yield in? I mean that information is out there. I mean it's uh, and, it's, and it's growing, and we you know we make that available to you. We got you know our hemp association and there are others. Um, that can help you provide that information. Now, we're not growers, but we know people who are. There's probably people sitting around you at the table here who, who can help you with that. But um, very legit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 right there. So, so at, at a scale, you know, you know, some people think, you're probably correct, like corn, uh, this, this industry, this hemp industry, is going to be industrial scale, you know, within two or three years. I mean, it's going to be big. It's already big out, you know, out west, in the Midwest, and people are growing thousands of acres. So, I mean, but can a small business person, a boutique person who wants to grow 30 acres, 20 acres, make a business out of it, right? Well, th there's a lot of questions you have to ask you know, to get there, but growing it, you know, process, drying it, processing it, you know, where do I sell it? You know, I mean, uh, what, what, what products do I want to develop? I mean, all those things. That's why we talked earlier, you gotta, have a bit, you gotta have a little bit of a plan. And I think the department and other resources, uh, as we start this business, you know, can be helpful to you and, and others. That's kind of what this conference is all about. Good questions and Jerry, I mean. I, I think both pilot projects by mandate from state statute are supposed to have a, a component of our report to the governor right. of the state of Florida and state legislators of an economic analysis. And although we can't scale that up very well to what it looks like for you in the field, we at least need to take a look at what people are seeing in other states on production costs. And the economics are changing da right. daily, right, Jeff? Um, and when you look at a combine like that, you don't see the front end of the combine. So I can't even discuss what the heads look like. But the important thing is, and in IFAS, we have ag engineers that are now starting to talk to our research team, and we're going to begin to take a look at mechanization because mechanization may allow even mid-sized farmers, if they can modify their existing combine, to harvest grain industrial hemp. And then we're a big beef cattle state, right? And there may be situations where we can harvest grain and, and run cattle through the field once FDA and USDA approves uh, that type of use of, of the hemp leaf material. Okay, we need to move on. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> hey, let's have a round of applause for our panelists. And I would be doing a disservice if I didn't mention pollen drift. There was that question. Um, I will say, we, in this state of Florida, we need a culture of communication. Um, some limited data shows anywhere from zero to three miles for pollen drift. Now, you tell me what that distance is. We don't know. And so you have a neighbor that's raising CBD hemp, or you have a medical marijuana permitted by Department of Health, then you got FDAC's permitting you all as growers, two different state agencies. 
You're going to need to work together, whether that's at your local Farm Bureau meeting or the coffee shop. Um, it's successfully done in Illinois and Ohio and Indiana with field corn production, although we only deal with a 600-foot setback for, for seed corn production in the state of Indiana. But if, if nothing else, if you remember nothing else from my message today, uh, hemp production in the state of Florida is going to require a culture of communication to protect yourself, um, limit access to lawyers, because if you don't have a culture of communication, you're going to find yourself possibly involved in some litigation. It's happening out west. Um, Jeff, no doubt, has heard of these horror stories out west. Um, the pollen can move into a medical marijuana grow operation or a CBD production field and drop that THC level drastically very quickly, and if, or CBD, uh, in the case of the permitted grower. And so we got to talk to each other, you all as growers. Um, that three miles looks like that's where people are landing, but like FDAX noted earlier, there's no hard science, especially in the state of Florida, um, uh, to really put that into rulemaking at present. So I wanted to ask that, answer that question for the gentleman in the back of the room. Thank you all. Thank you all. I appreciate the great questions. Appreciate the panel. All right, everybody. Uh, just a couple of quick housekeeping things before I let you all get to lunch. I know some of you have definitely.